Welcome. My name is Rachel Kai from Maven. Welcome to our panel about how to lead in tough times. This event is hosted by Maven, which is where leaders from all the top tech companies and businesses teach live courses. As an example, two of our guests today have courses on Maven. We have uh, Dave Klein, who teaches Management Accelerator, a top-rated management course on Maven, now in its eighth cohort, so congrats to Dave. And Ethan Evans, our moderator and host today, who teaches How to Break Through to Executive, a newer course on Maven that already has over 200 graduates, which is really amazing. And both courses have cohorts coming up soon. Um, we are also joined by Molly Graham, who will introduce herself shortly. And we are actually missing a panelist, but for a good reason. Molly West Duffy is having her baby right now as we speak. So if you see her online, shoot her some congrats. We're super happy and excited for her. And it's the best reason to <laughs> miss a panel. So before we get started, I have three quick requests for everyone to help this event run smoothly. First is uh, to please keep yourself on mute if you're not already. I think everyone is already doing that. Second, if it's convenient for you, please turn on your cameras. We love seeing your reactions, seeing you nod to know how things are resonating. That's very helpful. And third, questions. We, there, we have a couple of Q&A opportunities in today's panel, and there's a Q&A feature in Zoom. On the very bottom bar of Zoom, you see like two speech bubbles. Open that up. Um, Ethan will be looking for the top voted questions there. So put in your questions, upvote. So you can definitely upvote and comment within that feature. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And without further ado, I will pass the mic to Ethan. All right, well, um, I'm on the West Coast, so I will say good morning, but wherever you are, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Ethan Evans. I'm a former uh, VP from Amazon where I started Prime Video and then Prime Gaming. I left three years ago to uh, teach and coach. And so you can find me on LinkedIn. I put my link in the chat earlier. And I'm super excited to do this um, panel because I think it's a, a hot question. We have tough times all over the industry and how to lead through them is very difficult. It's something my clients ask me. I'm sure it's a question you have. And so with that, um, I wanna get to the meat and I'd love to turn it over and let Dave say a few words about himself, and then we'll go to Molly. Awesome. The quick version on me, um, I've led teams from two to 200 people uh, over the last 25 years. So mo majority of that was uh, a decade at Moody's, uh, as well as a decade at Bridgewater Associates, uh, the world's largest hedge fund. Uh, about two years ago, uh, I left there uh, in a similar path to Ethan. Uh, we created the Management Accelerator with our partners at Maven. Um, we've run, I think we just said eight. Uh, we've also run another 10 or so privately at companies. So we've run almost one of our month long accelerators every month since we started. Uh, we're just about to crack 750 leaders through it. Uh, so it's been a, a wild, fun ride and I'm excited to get into this conversation. Right. Molly. Um, all right, hi everyone, I'm Molly. Um, let's see, who am I? I have spent the last, uh, 15 plus years operating inside of startups. Um, I started at Google and then Facebook and then have been a COO of a number of different organizations from, um, a big philanthropy to a fun SaaS startup and lots of other things. Um, and these days, the thing I spend most of my time on is running a community for operators for startups for folks that are running and holding up the walls and the ceiling inside of startups. Um, and there are some of them, I see you guys on this call today, just can't get enough of me. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, that's what I spend most of my time doing. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here and for, for taking on these hard questions. Um, I always love, by the way, please uh, do use the Q and A function and you're allowed to vote in Q and A. So if you see questions, come in there. There are none right now that you would like to make sure we answer. We won't have time for very many questions. So definitely, as we get close to that, I will prompt you to go vote. But let's jump right in for the panelists. And I'll, I'll start with Molly and we'll alternate uh, a little bit. Um, but the first real question, can you share an experience where you've needed to lead successfully through a challenging period and a little bit about what lessons could be applied to the current environment? 
Yeah, for sure. So um, I just want to acknowledge, like, for those of you that are inside of startups, like, all phases are hard. There is no such thing as a phase where you're like, gosh, this is so fun and easy and we're winning. Like I was at Facebook from 2008 to 2012 when we went public. And I'm sure from the outside, it seems like everything must have been roses and unicorns that poop rainbows. But actually a lot of that was incredibly hard um, as well. And it constantly felt like we were driving a car off the road. Um, but I think relevant to like what a lot of people are going through now and what 2024, I think will bring probably more of is, you know, when you're running out of money or you have to do another layoff or things like that. And I, um, ran a company from, uh, 2020 to 2021 called, um, Lambda school. And, um, it's an incredible business. It's basically trying to create economic opportunity for, uh, people that, um, are trying to move from jobs that pay them like $20,000 a year to jobs that pay them $80,000 a year. And we did training and um, placement um, into tech jobs. And uh, it's a, for a variety of reasons, a very hard business to make work because you have to spend a huge amount of time investing in humans before you get any sort of return on that investment as a business. Um, and so we were on, I would say, the layoff train and the sort of turnaround train before it hit you know, the rest of the technology industry. Um, and uh, I led that company through what I would call like a, a pretty reasonable turnaround. And we did a lay two layoffs back to back uh, or a year apart, I guess. Um, and I think like my two biggest things uh, that I would say to anyone going through the years that we've been through are number one, decisiveness. Um, I have never met a single leader that was like, gosh, I did that too early. We should have waited longer, like whoops, laid people off or made that hard decision or fired that person or whatever your version of hard is like, shoot, should have waited another six months. No, it's always like we should have done that a year earlier. We should have done that. I should have made that decision a month after I joined, not six months. And so I think the hardest thing is like really forcing yourself as a leader to, um, to face down the hard things and to say, you know what, we have to do something hard and we have to, and doing it as early as possible is basically almost always the right decision. Um, and then the second, uh, thing I would say is like, <clears throat> you know, don't let the pain make decisions for you, you know, particularly when it comes to layoffs and having to let people go and things like that, like, these are human decisions. If you are in any kind of empath, which I like very much, and I'm an Enneagram too. I'm like a people person. Like, um, it's like devastating to have to do these things. You take it personally. You think it's because you're failing, whatever, whatever. Um, you put the layoff list and you know, each person's name, you know, their family history, and it can be really, really hard to, uh, decide those things when you're thinking about the impact on the people. And it often, if you let that pain, that empath lead, you actually make the wrong decision for the business. And let me just tell you, there is nothing worse than getting, for example, to the other side of a layoff and being like, shoot, I thought this was a 30% layoff and it should have been a 50% layoff, you know, which is an experience I think a lot of leaders have had in the last couple of years. So, um, I think the the more that you can um, lead with the business and do what's right for the company, because better that some people have jobs than no one, um, and uh, let the pain come in the way that you communicate, the way that you talk to people, let that be how you lead, um, or that be when the pain is is a useful force, uh, that uh, that is certainly a lesson I've learned over and over again. I just echo one thing Molly said. Yeah, um, absolutely. I was going to have you give your version too. So yeah, well, there's just one piece. Um, some of the companies we've worked with over the last two years have gone through rifts. And I, I'm finding that, um, to Molly's point, the people who do it once and well, um, I think people who are in startups sort of know that that is part of the game. And so like, while they don't, they're not happy about it, they like forgive it. I've worked with others where I saw like three in a six month or a nine month window. And it is, I don't think it's recoverable. Like, I think at that point on the third one, they're like, it's not the first one is forgivable because you can't see the future, but then you did it again wrong. And now it's like, I have no trust in leadership and, and all the stars are running. Um, and so I think it is hard in that moment, but like to see the second order consequences playing out in different companies, um, I, 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 was, I just underscores your point. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I strongly agree. Of course, I've been through, I've been on both sides of layoffs. Um, yeah. And I, I think- for me, the big thing that I talk about is also 
transparency for the people that are left, you have to go immediately into retention and motivation, explaining to them how it's still going to work and why to believe. And if you're not building that trust in treating the people who are leaving humanely and well, and then also being transparent about where the business uh, stands. I recently posted about on LinkedIn about how I once had to tell my whole team, we're out of money. Your paycheck today will clear, but next week, if you come into work, I can't guarantee you'll be paid. Our VCs say they're going to bridge you, bridge us, but the money hasn't shown up. So I hope you come in, but like you're doing it on faith. And everybody came in and the money did come in and it was great. Well, great in quotes, right? Tolerable. But telling people, honestly, like we are out of money. And if you come in on Monday, it may be sunk volunteer effort. People can make a choice about that. They feel bad if you, you know, if you hide that. Well, first, it's illegal to have people work when you can't pay them. But second, if you hide it, you'll never get that trust back. Uh, Yeah. Safety tips. Stay away from things that are crimes. Yeah, I was going to touch on that later in the panel. And then Dave, I'll let you answer the question. But I, um, a friend of mine says, people always know. And the worst thing you can do as a leader is have people stop trusting you, that you'll tell them the truth. And so I think transparency is um, essential. And, you know, it's transparency with caution and um, I always say you don't want to take people through every single hill and valley of a fundraise, right? Like we were emailing with Andreessen and they never emailed us back. Like, no, employees yeah. don't know that. But there is a fundamental transparency that's really essential as a leader to like help people go on the journey with you in like a productive way. Um, and if you don't, if you pretend like everything's roses and unicorns that poop rainbows and then it's all of a sudden you're out of business, um, like people know, they know, and they know you're lying to them. Yeah. And that's unrecoverable. Um, it's interesting that we all three sort of went to the same place. Like, I think when you go through these hard times, inevitably the hardest thing you have to do is restructure your team is to like, let people go. Um, I have the unfortunate, uh, experience of having been through multiple cycles perhaps. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about was like, well, what did I get wrong in 2008? Um, and then what did I have to, what, what did lessons that I learned to apply, you know, during the pandemic when I got to have the good fortune of doing it again. Um, the two that came to me, um, one was like, is like legal and HR. Um, I think it's important to remember that they're advisors, not strategists. Um, like they're incentivized to protect the company. Um, and I like applaud that. And I appreciate that. And it's necessary. Um, but a lot of us as leaders of our business units or our teams are responsible for like achieving great outcomes. And so you're going to get, at least I experienced this as like a lot of pressure to like almost like what Molly was saying, like, let the pain sort of lead, like, what would be the least painful thing from a legal perspective might be to like cleave off a function or like take out a whole team. But I've worked really hard to go out in the world and find my stars. And so like, maybe I have to be a little more clever and creative and push back to retain my stars and not just do the easy function cut. Um, And so I think that was one lesson of it went a lot better when I took that under advisement but was strategic, was creative, was clever about making sure I left with the best team because I was about to be asked to do more with less. And so I absolutely want my all-star team as part of that. And then I think the other one is also very related, which is um, there's nothing that's going to happen in the moment of actually delivering this news uh, that's going to make it easier for anybody. And so the, the sort of the, my shorthand was like, you know, be direct, be caring and be helpful, you know, like, just say it like in the same way Molly was saying about the big picture. They also know the little picture. Like they know why that meeting is on their calendar. They know why you're having it. And so shoot them straight, um, treat them like humans. You know, like I think you can in that moment be a robot and be very much and like, no, these are like the people who have been in the trenches with you. And so you can be a human. Um, and then I did find like really being helpful after the fact, like we all have networks. We can all make, you know, we can make connections. Like there's nothing that prohibits us from helping these folks go find the place where they'll be a players. Um, I think it takes a little bit off your conscious. And I, one of the benefits of having those multiple cycles is just seeing how many people have gone on to do amazing things. Like my numbers are like nine out of 10 people came out better, even though that moment was exceed, exceedingly hard. Yeah. yeah. I strongly agree with the idea that you've got to invest something in the outplacement, even though as a founder or as a leader, your focus is so much on how do I keep people and how do I move forward? Because a layoff doesn't, it's necessary, but like now you have a 
a smaller company still trying to survive. Right. Uh, but how you treat those people also helps your retention. I, I don't say do it for that reason. You treat people who are leaving well because it's the right thing to do. But investing in that is also a, an act of retention for your current team because they see, oh, I work for a leader who cares about people and who's going to try to help everyone. Um, so uh, we, let's go ahead and pivot to our second question, long-term vision. So in these situations, these tough times, when growth is slow, when business isn't coming through, how do you balance working on your mission with all the short term of, well, this customer wants a bunch of custom features right now, but they are paying, you know, that long-term, short-term outlook. How do you think about that? Because in good times, maybe you have a, we can do most things or we can do everything, but in tough times you can't. So how do you balance long-term and short-term? And maybe Dave, will give you a first crack at this one. Um, well, I would say that my, my starting point would be don't, don't fall for averages was sort of like what I was thinking about, which is it's very easy in this moment to look at, you know, the the Spotify news from this week and be like, everyone's laying off. Um, but again, I, having this window into other companies, like I, I'm working with an AI company that has has 5X to this year of their employees. So like one of the, just like know what's actually going on in your company, like don't automatically like assume the worst. Um, and within that, if the company is sort of shrinking or pivoting, um, learn what the new scoreboard is, right? Like Ethan, you used the word survival. Like I do think that's a lot of, um, you know, when when talent is flowing and cash is free, we're all about like capturing the biggest land mass. Um, and I think right now people are much more like, how long can I survive? Like, so I don't have to raise again. How long can I extend my cash? Um, and then if that is your scoreboard, right? If the scoreboard is now survival, then it's like staring hard at your at your team and saying, what levers do I have? Am I in part of the company that can drive more revenue? Uh, or am I in the part of the company that's a cost center and therefore I need to do more with less and pull those levers as hard as you can? You know, like there's not only there's a magic, there's not a lot of magic. Um, there is going back to basics, stripping out bureaucracy, like get rid of the crappy meetings, um, fire the unprofitable clients. Um, one of the people we worked with, we went through an assessment and we're like, we're all, we're all burned out and we can't grow. And I'm like, are these 20% of your clients profitable? And the answer was no. Um, in fact, they were losing quite a bit of money on them. And so they just raised prices on them and half of them left and now half of them are profitable and they got back a bunch of capacity. Um, so I use it just as an example of like, look for the hard places to say no and say no. Um, yeah. I think that's probably the main thing. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that something no one is good at, even in good times is saying no. <laughs> Totally. Uh, so if you're going to practice it, it's a skill to practice now. Uh, and, you know, I always say like companies could be infinite numbers of people. You could have seven people just working on your like Instagram strategy. So like you, you have to make choices and um, that is something that is very easy to lose track of when you have a lot of money and a lot of time. And it is essential when things are hard. Um you have to get good at saying, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that this year. And um, uh, Claire Hughes Johnson, who just published her book, Scaling People, says, uh, she says, strategy strategy should hurt. And and I always say that if you're, yeah, I, I say something far less eloquent. Um, so I've just <laughs> stolen her phrase. Um, but, but her point is, if you are not making decisions about what not to do that feel deeply painful, like, yeah, we're literally going to punt that a year, then you're probably not actually setting a strategy. Um, you're just saying we're going to do a little bit of everything. Um, so I really agree with the no, the no point. And that goes to who we're going to hire. That goes to day-to-day -day decisions as much as it goes to the longer term decisions. Um, and then the second point I would really echo what Dave said is just like realism. Um, like one of the patterns that I've failed at in the past, and I've been you know, this last year, I think has caught a lot of CEOs off guard is um, in the, in the past, it was all about like uh plan for growth. And so it was like, okay, we're going to build this foundation, expensive foundation, and then we're going to grow on top of it. We're going to like grow and earn it. We're going to grow into it. And I think that um, 
if your numbers are flat or if your numbers are down or if you're growing 10% a year, you need to be you a lot more of your infrastructure, a lot more of your investment needs to be for where you are today. You don't need to be, let's say you have 500 customers, you don't need infrastructure that supports 2000. Um, it's a different playbook than it, than the one that was coached, uh, you know, for the last 10 years, at least in the tech industry. And a lot of the double layoffs, double cuts, whatever, triple, quadruple that I'm seeing is people that in the first round didn't actually cut to where they are genuinely today. Um, they said, oh, we're still going to preserve this investment for the future. And that's very scary as a CEO, but it's it's now is the time to do it because I don't necessarily think 2024 is going to be easier than 2023 was in terms of just particularly the tech industry. And so like, I think being very realistic, the other version of realism though, I just want to say is like, I talked to a startup the other day that was like, yeah, we grew to like zero to 10 million this year. And we're growing to 50, like we're putting the goal on the board. That's 50 million next year. <clears throat> and I was like, well, that's cute. And what are you going to do? How is your team going to feel when it's 30? Cause like three Xing would be fucking amazing for most companies next year. Right. And you just made that feel like a failure um, because it's not 50. So I do think storytelling is a and, and being really realistic about goal setting and being really thoughtful about how that all pairs together is really important in times when you actually genuinely probably don't know what next year is going to bring. Um, I have run startups where we were like, we're going to set ambitious goals. And let me tell you, there's nothing more demoralizing than sitting through an all hands where everything's red. So like, just be careful about making successes feel like failures because your goals were too ambitious or, you know, things like that. So. All right. Well, I'm going to take us to the live Q&A here in just a second. So if you haven't looked at that and voted, be sure to scroll down and find the great questions that maybe aren't appearing in the top of the window. Um, but before we do that, the thing I would observe, and I think both of you are saying this in a way, is honestly how much pain small teams can take. I'm often surprised by the startups I was a part of, as well as larger companies, that if everyone's aligned and motivated, they, they actually can weather just lots of bad news and lots of hard times and keep going because they believe in the work, they believe in their teammates, they believe in the environment. Yes, some people will jump, but the people who remain behind often will stick to the bitter end and be rattling the chain doors if it doesn't go well, you know, and they'll be asking like, can we restart this somehow? Are we allowed to take the code base? And having that esprit de corps, if you focus it, then you can come out. And I agree with everything that was said about the death by multiple cuts, you know, like this is the one layoff survivable, two layoffs, maybe survivable, you know, three plus you're just kidding yourself at that point. You're just like refusing the inevitable. Um, <clears throat> but I want to get to some of the great questions that have been asked. And there's uh, one here at the top that's got a ton of interest. That question is, how do you build confidence to keep rock stars in your team? How do you keep them motivated and trust in the company and you? And I think this is in the context of these hard times and particularly shrinking. So Molly, you want to take a, a first shot at that? How would you... How, how do you keep the stars from fleeing? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> the thing I always um, talk to CEOs about when they're going through something, a hard time, numbers trending down or a layoff, um, is people, people are individuals. I realize that sounds stupid, but here's what I mean, uh, which is every single person has a different reason for why they are at your company why they are on your team. And they have a different set of things that motivate them to come to work every day. And if you, you know, particularly when you are going through hard times, um, if it's a bigger team, you can really focus on your high performers. If it's a small team, you can know the answer for everyone. But at the end of the day, what you want to know and understand is what is the motivating factor for every person on your team? Why are they there? Um, to be honest, uh, having now managed a lot of people, I would say for the vast majority of people, it is not a title and it is not money. That is a temporary band-aid for, you know, their ego a lot of times, or, you know, in some cases, a financial thing is, is about being able to like live, which obviously matters for people. Um, 
but uh, you can give people more money and they're unhappy. They're still going to quit sometime in the next six months. Um, the thing that keeps people around, regardless of the circumstances of the company, is personal growth. And that is very individual. What what do I want? What am I getting out of this? So the more that you can really craft paths for individuals um, and figure out how they can grow, regardless of even if the company's shrinking, people can grow, right? They can get more responsibility. Like I've literally had conversations with people where they're like, but the company may go out of business. And I was like, think of what you'll learn. Like, you'll be like, I went out of, I, I'd help that company went out of business and I learned how to shut something down. And, you know, it wasn't my fault for a variety of reasons. Cause it almost never is like people can learn in a, in a wide variety of circumstances, depending on what is important to them. So I, I just really think focusing on the individual is like almost always the right answer, but particularly in, in tough times. Yeah. So before I pass this to you, Dave, um, I would just comment, we, we've been discussing a lot in startup context, and I know we have a lot of people here who are leaders in larger companies. Everything we're saying about a startup really applies to a team or almost everything. So if, if you're part of a very large company, like I came from Amazon most recently after a bunch of startups, if you're running a team, that team is your startup. So hopefully what we're saying translates. And with that, Dave, what would you uh, like to add? And with that, kick it to the corporate guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I was going to say what's interesting is um, how we all have different paths in different companies and you end up arriving at roughly the same place. Um, like we spend a lot of time um, in our program talking about motivation for the people on your team. And what we'll say is like some of it you can control as a leader and maybe I'll focus on those, but some of it's up to them, to Molly's point. Like some people will be driven by the mission. Some people will be driven by their own personal growth. Some will be driven by the reward, which might be financial or non-financial. Um, and so part of it is like, they need to be opting in. And I think in times of duress and times of shrinking, like the people who aren't mission aligned, the people who are there for the reward, et cetera, will probably leave. And that's okay. Um, and then you'll have people who are, are very aligned to those things and will probably stay. And so you're really focused on the middle, right? The people who could be swayed one way they're good, they're impactful. Um, and for me, I think in addition to development, the other thing that I'm staring at is um, I'm getting pressured to do more with less, which usually means do the exact same work with fewer people. And what I want the team focused on is how do we do better with fewer, right? Which means moving both the work and the people. And so one of the other ways I think people get demotivated is either they're working on stuff that's no longer impactful. So the thing that I can do there is say, is this really deeply connected to the mission? If, if yes, great. If not, let me get them on something that is. Then it's like, is the work really efficient? Because I want to have impact and I don't want to do a lot of bureau bureaucracy and paperwork and nonsense that is not absolutely critical. So can I strip that out? Um, and then you get down what's all that's left then is like, well, if I have mission critical work and I have highly efficient work, then I might have too much. And that's when you sort of come back to some of those no's where like I might need to say goodbye to unprofitable customers or I might need to exit a product line or something else. Um, but if I think if I can do that, if I can really you know, focus the work to be great and then combine that with Molly's point on development, um, I think that's the best you can do. Right. I don't, I don't have like, I don't think the cahoots and the pizza parties are going to get it done. Um, I think you sort of focus on those basic core things that keep people aligned. Yeah. And I, I love these answers and particularly the one about personal growth. You, I've grown the most through painful situations, which I wish wasn't true. Like all of us teach and we have communities We're we're trying to help people learn from experience, not through pain, but you know, the fact is a lot of it, you learn through pain. So yeah. we have the next question is directed to you, Dave, but I think it's a good one for all of us. And it's asking that que the question of what did you fight for in what made enough of a star for you that you fought for them? So you had talked about in your example that when uh, when HR was suggesting cut a whole team or legal, that you mm -hmm. took it as advice, but chose more carefully. What were you choosing for? What what how are you doing? And there's a lot of interest in stars here, which doesn't surprise me, but what made stars to you? Um, I mean, for, again, I think everyone will sort of define their own. For me, it was a combination of like character and ability to create impact, right? So there's part of, are we values aligned? Are, are you mission aligned, et cetera? And then there is a just 
if you've, if you've, I'm sure you saw it at Am I'm sure you both have seen it, right? When you work with that person who is a star, it's just like a two X contribution. They're just like twice as good. It's twice the 10 X developer. Like there's lots of versions of it. Um, and honestly, like the way that I got around it was the, we were, I, I mean, it's a very specific scenario, but people can probably extrapolate the lesson. Like I was, I had a team in five offices and the thought was, well, you could just get to your 25% cut by closing one of the, like by taking this function out of one of the offices. Um, and I was like, well, I could, but like each of those offices had a particular person who was like in that category. And so what we did instead was um, we actually just reorganized as part of the riff to now be functional. That was no longer geography based. And I was able to preserve those stars by being by by partnering a riff with a reorg um, without sort of running afoul of any like legal issues. Um, and so I think. Anyways, I, I just I just encourage people to be clever. Like, don't don't get pitch it. Like, at least ask the question, right? Like, it is so hard to get those people to let one go out the door. Um, it's just I don't know. It's like it's a mortal sin in my mind. <laughs> like, I would I, fight. I will share the larger companies. You know, obviously, I talk a lot to my former Amazon colleagues, and they've had a lot of layoffs. The first and second level managers are having the list handed down to them. So we won't go into that, but that's very tough. Even still, any chance you have to fight if you think it's a mistake, yes. um, you know, it, you can't fight the numbers, maybe. The cut has to be X deep, but yep. you do need to fight for who it is. Molly, what would yes. you add to this on STARS? Well, it's been a while since I've had a list handed to me. So uh, I, I, had four, I don't even know. Uh, what my advice would be in that case. But um, I do think in the case of stars, stars are interesting because I think um, in startups, it's it's usually pretty obvious and sometimes they're hiding. Like one of the things that you find when you do do a layoff um, is there can really actually be opportunities for new people to shine because they have more space um, promoting someone, you know, that you thought was maybe a year or two away from running finance to running finance, like all of a sudden they're running finance and it turns out, whoa, they were actually ready now. And, you know, so I think the, the upside of some of these dark moments can be to create opportunities for people. It's what I mean about personal growth, which is like, yes, it's dark. And, um, for individuals, it can be transformative because you got opportunity that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So I think using those moments as a moment to invest in people is a is a very, very smart thing to do as a leader, figure out where you're placing your bets for the future. Um, the other side of it, though, I would just say is that uh, sometimes it's time to let people move on. And in, in darker times when you are trying to retain people, you can find yourself turning into a pretzel for some random high performer who just isn't happy. Um, and you can pretzel yourself with more money. You can pretzel yourself with titles. You can pretzel yourself with opportunity. And it and there, it's always good as a leader to ask yourself whether it's too much of a pretzel at some points. And I think as companies evolve, um, it is just true. And this is just maybe particularly true in startup land because things change very fast. Like sometimes people just don't belong anymore for one reason or another. And I think that's good to be realistic about too. Just because someone was a high performer in certain circumstances doesn't make them permanently a high performer um, because circumstances change. So I think like being cautious about the pretzel thing uh, has always, uh, I guess it's bitten me in the ass a bunch of times. So. <laughs> Well, I, I would say um, I'll share my very first promotion fits a little bit what you're talking about. I have often referred to it as a Klingon promotion. So if you're at all a Star Trek fan, the way the Klingons got promoted was kill the person above them. Well, I didn't cause this person's removal, but you know the position above opened up, the person was moved out and I was kind of the one standing in the gap. And I was in my first job, I'd only been at the job less than a year and they're like, hey, it's you you know, next person up and I flowered given the opportunity. Um, so I, I want to move on now to a couple of the questions we were planning uh, a little bit, um, a lightning round just to make sure we get through them. So employee engagement, um, I think you have already touched on this some Molly, so maybe it's redundant, but when opportunities for promotions and big new projects dwindle, what innovative strategies are there? And and I do think you've said some of this, but is there anything I guess you would add to the the 
how to keep the people motivated in a world where they're not going to get promoted or see people, you know, coming in under them, like you're shrinking. So that's not happening. I mean, <laughs> my answer is my predominant answer is the same, which is treat people as individuals and okay. and uh, focus on their personal growth. But I think, you know, the other thing is just like a lot of my favorite times in life, work life have been uh, working with a small team that I loved in circumstances that were really hard, that didn't feel like winning. Um, and I really think loving the people you work with, like somebody once said to me that, if you're going to go to a pre-product market fit startup, so one that doesn't know really what its business is and you're sort of throwing spaghetti at the walls, the only thing that matters is the team. And he said, it's like going to war with people. I mean, who the, I've never been to war, so that's a terrible analogy. But like, you know, he's like, it's basically going to battle every day and you have to believe in love and trust the people that are with you that have your back. And I really do think that like my favorite times have not necessarily been because everything was peachy keen on the business, like, or going well, I've led a lot of things that were failures. And like, I've loved those times because of the people that were around me. And because we felt like a team, we felt like we were fighting together. I think the worst thing you can do as a leader is make, <laughs> I mean, the worst leaders can make successes feel terrible, right? They can make, they can take all the joy out of winning. Um, so the best leaders can make struggling feel fun. Meaning like, it's not going to feel fun because, you know, growth and winning solve a lot of problems, but like, it feels like there can be joy in going to work every day and feeling like you've got a great team around you. I guess that's the only other thing I'd add. Yeah. So I agree with you strongly. And it's some of my favorite times looking again from the big corporate side have been uh, outages or customer complaints. So these are shorter lived in a way, but you have a, a big system down. Suddenly your meeting calendar, you get to blow it up, right? It's into the war room. And oh my God, what do we do? And uh, I, you know, unfortunately, I've been in a few war rooms that drug on for a couple of weeks because the problem was that hard to solve. But you get to bring everybody together and work around the clock. And, uh, you know, I guess a way to exemplify what you're saying is when is working around the clock either fun in the moment or fun as a memory or both, as opposed to drudgery? And there are those circumstances. Dave, what what would you say? Uh, two quick thoughts. One, um, that thing you just said about the war room is another tactic that you can use to find things to say no to. Like if all your meetings fall off the calendar because of the war room, like that's probably a good hint anyway. of things you can say no to. Like we, one like thought exercise, like we would do business continuity planning at Bridgewater, right? Where the for one day you'd run the company from another location. Um, well, it kind of tells you a lot of like what really matters because that's the stuff we have to do. And then what is around it that might be about improving or new innovations, et cetera. Um, so anyways, I just, you said that and it just connected mm -hmm. for me like that's super practical, like run the business continuity or run the outage in your mind and look at your calendar and be brave. Um, the thing, I think I can answer, answer the Ethan all, uh, question as well as this one, because I was going to go to transparency anyways for like the other thing that I would do. And he had asked a question about the right level of detail. Yeah, go for um, it. Uh, I think that the, I think the question is not the right level of detail. I actually think it's a frequency thing. Like I think in these moments of chaos and crisis, um, what people want to know is that you've got it. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is, um, I don't know, we, we had a, we, when I did this, we had called like, it was the metaphor of like a symphony. It's like, you wanted the good music you were playing to drown out the bad music of their anxiety. And so one of the things you need to do is just sort of keep showing up. Um, so it is like, here's the decision we've made and I've been clear about it and here's the new strategy and now here's the focus. And you can do that with, it's a loom on Monday and then it's like an email to the team on Tuesday and it's this, this volume. Um, one of the best tricks within that is you will not have all the answers, right? Because everything's changing. And so you don't have, tell them what your questions are. Like, that's the thing they want to know. Like they're worried that they see something that you don't see. And so you can say like, yeah, we don't know exactly what we're going to do yet, but that's a question we're trying to figure out. We don't know if we're going to have to make a cut, but we're like really staring hard at that. And that's a way that I think you can be authentically transparent without, you know, you sort of keep the trust that Molly talked about um, without going silent. Like when you go dark for a month, that is when people freak out. And so you can sort of play the symphony, be honest about the questions and sort of bring them the answers as you have them. And I find that works um, it works pretty well. And especially the high performers like deeply appreciate that. And it's another way to like keep them motivated because they keep getting signal of like, where do I point my attention? What do I go do? How do I, how do I help? Yeah. I mean, just to piggyback on that, I would say 
um Ethan to your question like uh there's probably like good parts of the roller coaster and bad parts of the roller coaster for them to be part of but probably the most important thing is that they know you're on a roller coaster right like saying like yeah we are fundraising like I I I am going to be spending a lot of my time as CEO I'm going to be spending a lot of my time over the next 6 months fundraising I will give you significant updates when there are useful things to know but I am not going to talk about most of it because honestly, fundraising is a very draining and whatever chaotic experience. And I just don't, you all do not need to be distracted about that. You want to know the best thing you can do to help us fundraise is make this hit our goals, like make this company successful. That will help make my fundraising journey easier. Um, that's just an example, right? Like I think the, the, the main thing is that, um, People are not stupid. Uh, they know where they know broadly where things are. Um, so I'm like, be clear and unapologetic about the things you can't control. Will there ever be a layoff? You have no idea. The answer is always, I don't know. Like, meaning I cannot control or commit to what's going to happen in the future. And I can tell you, we're not planning one right now. Or uh, I can tell you that like, we're going to do everything in our power to make that not the path. And if it happens that way, I'll, I'll make sure that you all know why, you know, whatever, like, don't try to pretend like, you know, when you don't, but I think saying like, listen, here's where we are and here's where possible futures lead. And like, here's what we're trying to make happen. This is why the goals are what they are. And if X, Y, Z happens, we may have to take a different path. Like those are conversations you should be able to have with the whole company. You don't need to bring them into the like, well, if this number moves here, this investor is going to be pissed and whatever. That's not like a useful level of detail. So it's about, it's about being realistic about sort of like being on the roller coaster, I guess, um, more than like bringing them through the day-to-day -day experience. 100%. And I, I think the, uh, it was funny. You talked about the roller coaster, man telling people, helping people understand that nothing helps fundraising like revenue, you know, or, or like product in the market. Um, so uh, we'll do one more question and then we'll try to get to some of the Q and A again. I think this one's really good though. Uh, a lot of people are struggling with, I have a smaller team. I'm being asked to do a lot or even, you know, everything I was, but I've lost people, whether that's in a startup or a larger company, how do you handle getting them both getting the most and being realistic about what you can do because your team's been cut 20%, but your mandate hasn't, or, uh, how, how do you, how do you walk down that path? And I'll, I'll let you two choose who, who, who rolls with this first. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dave has to go first. Ah. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Dave so has to go first. Thank you. I, I know. I'm that. like, sorry. You think just, can you just give me the setup yeah, one the, more time? The question is, oh, I can I'll, I'll make too. it much more simple. I have a yeah. smaller team and I'm still being asked to do a lot. How do I get more efficient? How do yeah, I sorry. remain productive? I distracted myself with my own rock, paper, scissors <laughs> joke. Um, so I, I have this... Um, I, so I personally, as a leader, have this belief, which is like, you should play games you are uniquely suited to win. And so uh, if I believe it, like the rules that I am being asked to play by are a rule I can't win, that I will make a different choice. Like I will, so, and what do those choices look like? That choice might be pushing back. That cho choice might be putting forth a different strategy. That choice might be leaving. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly, um, but I, that's sort of my test. And so like, if I'm being asked to do a thing that is like impossible, then like, I, I would rather just get on with it to, to help them find someone who thinks that's possible. Um, I'll make my case. I'll use my data. Like hopefully I've been running. I, I tend to encourage leaders to run your team very systematically. Um, that doesn't mean like robotically, but like hopefully you have some baseline data. Hopefully you have some basic metrics. Um, hopefully you have something you can anchor to if you're going to make a case. Maybe that's outside data. Like there's lots of ways to do it. Um, and then I think you sort of get put in that gray spot of leadership to say like, this is, is this realistic or unrealistic? If it's realistic, then what am I going to do? If it's unrealistic, how do I push back? Um, and if my pushback is unacceptable, you might hear like, sorry, well then we'll find someone who can do it. And like, that's, it's a hard choice to make, but I, I've watched too many people spend their lives, like trying to win an unwinnable game. And like, that's not how you become the most impactful you can be. So that, that would yeah. be my pitch. Um, 
again, I'll probably answer this like a startup leader, just because it's not usually things are not handed down to you as much as they are a choice. And so like, when I think about, okay, we have to do the same amount with less people or whatever. Um, often my question is, do you? Uh, because usually um, one of the problems that happens is sort of like starting from your current state and cutting, right? It feels like cutting off an arm and a leg. We have these goals. We were doing all these things. Now we are going to chop off our arm and try to do the same set of things. So a lot of what I um, uh, really challenge people to do in these moments is start from zero. So ask, if I were starting this company again today, knowing what I know now, what would I do? If I were start, what what would I focus on? Who would I hire? This is a great way, by the way, to build a layoff um, at, if you are genuinely doing it for a whole company, which is if we were starting from zero today, what would we do? Not how do we go from what we are today to what we need to be? Um, it's the problem with the sort of like finance led riff is it's all about cutting to a number versus like, okay, what is the business and how do we support the business? Um, by the way, it's the same thing with firing someone, because a lot of times you're thinking this person is here. How do I help them incrementally grow? Whereas if you say, if I were to have their salary and be able to rehire someone for that salary, what would my expectations be of that person? And usually when you wipe it clean and you ask what you could hire for, it turns out the gap is not this big. The gap is this big. Um, and, and I feel like <clears throat> in a lot of these cases, we think all the things we're doing are important and necessary. And it turns out about half of them aren't. Um, or we think the person is an inch away and they're a mile away. Um, so really starting, it's, you know, it's the same thing as zero based budgeting for those of you that are in finance, like zero base whatever problem you are in and start over again, because usually you are wrong about what it is you think you have to do. Yeah. So I agree strongly. I come at that at a different angle, which is, I think of how much software I come from the software world. I think a lot of us do, you know, looking at people in the chat, what they've said, so much software gets built and never shipped or built and wasted. Uh, it doesn't work. If you have to think you have to do so much as to the degree you can get down to that famous, you know, minimum lovable product, minimum viable product. And what can we test, particularly as a small company, what can we put out to prove that it works and get a few customers really using it is normally the way I, I was, um, you know, people, uh, this is a debate as a leader, I encourage hacking. And the bad, not not the, I'm not talking about hacking in the sense of um, breaking security, but instead putting out hacks. Uh, because I would rather test and get some customers on an unsupportable hack in some cases to see that what I'm building is right than invest in this, you know, dead monument to beautiful architecture. And I know I, I, I argue with engineers about this all the time, but I point out, if you want to build this monument to beautiful architecture, there's a good, there's such good odds it will never see the light of day. And so please join me in let's put out something that offends your sensibilities and then rebuild, at, at least as a way to, to prove market fit. So we have time for one question, uh, I think. And that question by a nose comes from Boris. And he asks, any comments? on reducing comp across the board rather than laying off. So the shared pain approach. Thoughts on that? I just wrote mine. Oh, I didn't know you were going to take that one. Well, you already take it? I'm like, oh, <laughs> I wish. Um, unfortunately, in 90% of cases, it just doesn't get you there. I promise you every single startup has looked at it and at it. the leader that's ever had to do it layoff has been like, you know, I have a lot of CEO friends that take a zero salary and, you know, whatever their salary is, it maybe saves one person, you know, so, or, and even if you spread it across a lot of people, it just, usually when you are at a layoff, like the decision is much bigger than, than what 15% of people's salaries are. Um, and, uh, yeah, I would just say like, it's, I, I would never get to a layoff lightly. It would be having tried everything else and, and realizing that the, the hill is just too big. Um, 
And uh, I, I know very few people that would like to go to it as their first resort for a bunch of different reasons. So um, that said, someone else asked the question, uh, start with yourself versus start with a team. Whew, always start with yourself. By the way, m- mistake I've seen, I've made, I've seen it made, like <clears throat> you're cutting a company from whatever, 150 people down to 50, you don't need the same leadership. So like, look at yourself too and start. And I would say, always start with yourself. Um, am I the right person to run the, whatever I'm running? Should the person that's great that works for me have that opportunity? You know, you're cutting from a series D startup to a series A startup, basically in terms of, for whatever reason, like maybe it is a different set of leaders. Maybe this isn't, you know, any, and you always think, oh, but then people will think bad things and the blah, blah, blah. And it actually is, it can often be a great thing for a new set of leaders. Like I said, opportunity for new people um, that have energy and are excited uh, to come in and run things. So, um, you know, listen, if if the the problem is 15% of everyone's salary, then then at least give them the choice. But usually the problem is is bigger than that from a dollar's perspective. Yeah, I agree with that. And Dave, I know you answered this a little bit in writing. Uh, anything you want to add on that real quick? No, it's, I came from a very different angle, which was more, and it's a little bit tied to your point, Ethan, of like, there's the what's left behind, right? And so in this case, you'd have everybody left behind at lower comps. And I'm like, wow, you need to have to, you have to have both a very um, us over me culture, like deeply ingrained from day one. And everyone would sort of be making those types of sacrifices historically. And you'd have to be pretty certain that everybody's looking at everybody else and being like, they're all rock stars. And I would say the probability of both those being true is approaching zero. And then if I layer in the practicality of, of what Molly said, which is like, and it won't get you there, um, like it won't be deep enough that like, I just, I, it would be lovely, but I think it's a, it is unicorns. Yeah, I think if you, you want to take a tweet away on this one, Boris, um, and everyone else, it's, it's not actually going to be enough. 15% layoffs theoretically a big company they're doing that maybe because they're managing a they're doing a financial management they're not going to approach it that way and in a startup if your problem is 15 percent inspire people to work harder uh, inspire people to get one more customer your problem is usually 30 percent 50 percent etc i'll also add and i've written about this in the past i've laid myself off as a part of of a big decrease because one of the functions i was running was recruiting you know, like uh, we're busy shrinking. I owned recruiting. I owned HR. I I was very expendable. And so what I actually did is, is like a closing story. Um, everyone got laid off that was going on day X. And I was employed to day X plus one to do that. And my, my last day was the next day. And then I rolled over to having invited everyone to a get together for like, let's network together to find our next jobs. So I, I went immediately from, sorry, today will be your last day to here I am with you. Uh, so that was a unique circumstance, but I leaders should definitely be considered for the list. Um, <clears throat> and the best, the best leaders will volunteer. The best leaders always say, should it be me? Um, yeah. That's the best people I've ever worked with. And, and I would just say as a leader, it's a good question to ask, ask it. Yeah. So, for my part, I want to thank everyone who's been here. Maven is, uh, Rachel, I think, is going to come back and has a closing for us. But I'm sure all of us, and I'll give Dave and Molly just one second each, we all deeply appreciate you being here. I start teaching my course on Breaking Through Executive. The cohort starts tomorrow morning. Uh, but we all really appreciate all of you taking your time and sharing it with us. Any closing words? And then uh, Rachel will come in, Dave, Molly. No, this is great. Thank you. It's really nice to, uh, the questions were really thoughtful and it's wonderful to meet all of you. Yeah. I, honestly, thank you to everybody. Like I was looked down at one point, I think we were over 300 people live, which is a wild number. Um, we, we have our cohort next cohorts in February. So any leaders out there who want to join us, uh, we, we'd love to have you. Rachel. Yeah, thank you. This was really amazing. We have a Maven tradition, which is to share a light bulb moment. So a light bulb moment is just an insight that's going to stick with you. So before folks jump off the Zoom, I would love everyone in the audience to just take 10 seconds to type in the chat, what's a light bulb moment that you had today? Would love to see that. And I will ask the panelists, Molly, did you have a light bulb moment that maybe someone 
else on this panel shared that you really yeah i was going to reinforce a point that dave said early which is that you said be direct be caring and be helpful and i was saying that's just like direct is kind and i feel like it's the same i love that uh, philosophy generally as a management philosophy dave how about you uh i sort of like I like one of the last things we were talking about, which is like Molly's point of like the best leaders um, will ask whether they should be first on the list. Um, and I think that is, I think that's the difference between a manager and a leader. So I agree. Love that. How about you, Ethan? Uh, I love the, well, boy, I, I want to give a whole list. I'll go with one. The, Dave mentioned the word impact several times. And I want to come back to the point. If you're making an impact, that's what performance is about. You're not, in the end, we think it's about doing work. Work has no point unless it has a result. So focus your team on what is the valuable outcome going to be the impact. For me, that's the light bulb. Love it. And I'm loving every, all of the amazing share outs. So uh, with that, I will play you out with a fun song. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Dave, Molly, and thank you Ethan for moderating a really great panel. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next year in 2024. Thank you. Know. Great job. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Ethan. Thank, Thank you, you Molly. everyone. Pleasure, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks.